Good morning. Thank you. I was worried the front pew was going to be empty, and I finally I, you, you came and I said, it would make me feel so much better. Uh, I want you to all turn around now, turn your, turn your look, your face, and go, thank you, Ro Roger, thank you, Russ. We don't do that enough. Okay, thank you. Oh, and Chuck, yeah, there we go. I can't get over to see every one of my daughter's concerts, and they had a concert on Friday night, and they tell you, well, you can just dial it up on YouTube and watch it live. And while you could watch it live, you couldn't hear a blooming thing, <laughs> because they had one microphone in the middle of the stage. And all you, you know, they're, they're, they start off with this beautiful Bach and, uh, minuet, uh, just, a, just a wonderful little Bach piece, and, and all you heard was, and then the conductor gets up there and says, thank you very, thank you. And it's like, oh. what I say? I don't know what he said. But I know that we have really good audiovisual people in this congregation, and then Chris takes all of that and makes it a beautiful video. It's wonderful. So yes, we're thankful for that. How many people got to see the, uh, the Halloween parade yesterday through downtown? Did you drive through downtown and see this? Uh, the best costume that I saw, and I told this to the Bible study people, that there was a dad dressed as the Grim Reaper complete with a scythe and everything. And behind him were two little skeletons. The problem though was the skeletons were all in proper costume, but the dad was wearing his Chicago Bears house robe. <laughs> so everything looked like the Grim Reaper, except it was blue and orange. But then after watching the Bears play last week, maybe that is an exact replica of what it should be. I don't know. Whatever. Well, welcome to worship this day. Oh, Jane, that's daylight saving time, not savings. She, five months I've been here and she made one mistake. Isn't that amazing? Announcements for the good of the community this day. You've read the ones that are on the screen. We need hushers. People to stand over on the side and go, shh. Uh, we also need worship leaders. Is that coming up there? Oh, look, they even made a slide to make Scott even more embarrassed, right? Look at that. It says, thank you for joining the team. Uh, other announcements, anything? Good morning. Good morning. You're out. Anybody? Bueller? No? Well, let's begin our time of worship this day. Please stand if you are able and join in our call to worship. As we come before God, remember that even on the darkest day, some light shines through the clouded sky. You, my Lord, I will worship at all times. Your praise shall continually be in my mouth. As we come before God, we affirm the best blessing of all. Christ Jesus, Lord, teacher and savior. My soul boasts in the grace of the Lord. Let even the afflicted hear and be glad. As we come before God, know you are never alone. For the spirit of truth is our friend and counselor. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exult together in God's name. Let us pray. Great God, awaken every ounce of sincerity within us. May we desire you more than anything else, value you above all earthly ambition and treasure, and adore you with a love which is free of guile or calculation. Count us among the sight-impaired beggars, that by the word of Jesus we may see more clearly, share more generously the good things you have done for us, and by faith, anticipate that even better things you will have in store for us. Through this same Jesus of Nazareth, we gather to worship and pray. Amen. You may be seated for our opening music. <clears throat> Thank you. 
and turn to that saving grace which refuses no soul that seeks forgiveness, healing, and restoration. Let us pray. Loving God, we find it extremely hard to admit mistakes. We participate in the evils of the world around us. We add to the confusion, anxiety, and cynicism of those around us. We confess that we save some of our worst moments to unload on those who are most love us, hurting the very persons whom we treasure dearly. Help us to make restitution where we can and leave the healing to you if things have gone beyond our ability to mend. Through Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. As followers on Christ's narrow road, remember that the same Lord who sets high standards also promises to forgive and restore those who come to him in faith. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and consistent and can be trusted to forgive our sins and cleanse us from our unloving ways. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Notice that Susan is not with us today. That is because she is with Sarah this weekend for fitting of wedding dresses. You'll notice where I am and not. Let us pray for her <clears throat> during this occasion. Just remember, dear, it's her wedding, not yours. Mm. Do we have joys to share our concerns of our church family? I know the season is over for the Sandwich Indians because the coach came down with COVID. 
So they're not playing anymore this year. Good to say. The sun did come up today. It just doesn't look like it. Yes, Brian. You finished harvesting beans on Wednesday. That's good. And now that you've got that top layer off, do you have some coming up again? Yes, you do. Yeah. Yeah. I was able to get down to Peoria this week and see Mark uh, Middleton. He had just come out of surgery, but he was, you know, they kept him comatose anyway, so I didn't get to talk to Mark, but I got to at least pray with him, and that was good. Um, John and Nancy will be developing a plan now for the future because all of his physical ailments have been taken care of. Now we need the rehabilitation part. So as soon as I find out where they're going to take him for rehabilitation, I will let you know. Um, so that is good news in that respect. Let us be the people of God in prayer. Thanksgiving and praise we bring to you, most loving Father. By your will, the starry galaxies wheel through space, and for your purposes, earth became a most pleasant habitation. Thank you for your patient providence, which brought human beings to life, made of stardust, yet with the breath of yourself quickening each one of us, for the unique nature of each person, yet the common humanity we share. Loving God, while we gather here in this house of love, others gather at the site of road accidents or around hospital beds or at the funeral home or at scenes of violence or murder. Comfort your distressed children and assist them to create something good out of what appears to be only pain and grief. Loving God, while we have a wide range of foods to enjoy, millions barely exist, and millions more who are literally starving, strengthen those who are attempting to bring food to the hungry and guide programs designed to improve methods of production and distribution. God of all nations, love each individual soul. Lover of each individual soul, we long for that day when human deprivation, abuse, and pain are no more. Keep your church both faithful and loving so that although the wonderful day may seem a long way off, we may gladly use our ordinary lives to hasten its arrival. Lord, hear the prayers we have shared amongst us, as well as those prayers that are without words, that are known to you and to us, perhaps even prayers that we don't know how to offer. We know you hear them. For it is to the praise of your name we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Through Christ Jesus, who teaches us the joy and hope of prayer when he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We take time for our offering, both plates in the front and the back, so please give as you see fit to the work of the church. Um, 
How many people wear glasses or have contact lenses? Okay, just a second. Now, how many people have contacts? Or... Okay, just checking. If uh, I was giving a children's sermon, I would let people look through my glasses and then they would all have headaches because mine are very, very strong. I have not had my vision corrected except by lenses because I've had each one of my family members have their LASIK surgery done on them and uh, I figured I'll let them be guinea pigs for me and someday I might get them, I don't know. Um, according, uh, and I'll, you'll hear this somewhere in my, yeah, I think the number is somewhere between 95 and 96% of everyone over the age of 50 have glasses. I'm just guessing maybe that's low. <laughs> Scott, you don't have glasses, do you? Yeah. Oh, you do? Oh, okay. Our scripture lesson today is a bookend passage, the end of a section, a teaching section from Mark's gospel. It begins with the healing of a blind man and it ends with the healing of a blind man. Chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Then they reached, they being Jesus and his disciples, they reached Jericho and Jesus and his disciple, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, which in Hebrew means son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus of Nazareth, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, and he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. Rabbi, teacher, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Aren't those clever? Carrots cut to look like potato chips. It won't fool anyone into thinking they're real chips, but it might serve as a substitute for those ever so wonderful, but you can't eat just one chips from heaven. And while eating carrots, can keep your eyes healthy, contrary to what your mother might have said, the vitamins and minerals found in your favorite orange veggie won't improve your eyesight. Sitting too close to the television might give you a nasty headache, but it won't impair your vision. I heard that a lot growing up. You're sitting too close to the television. It'll damage your eyes. Actually, I found sitting close to the screen useful in two respects. One, I could annoy my sisters by blocking their view. <laughs> and two, my parents discovered I was nearsighted a lot sooner than they thought I was. I have worn glasses since the second grade. An adult, probably your parents, have told you this at some point during your childhood, to stop making weird faces in public. 
Crossing your eyes was the biggest no-no. If you cross your eyes for too long, they'll stay like that. Anybody? Her? Yep, okay. Funny thing is, your eyes are meant to come closer together and farther apart. And they will always return to their normal placement when you quit clowning around. 95% of, yeah, there's, this, there's the chart. I like that. That's good. 95 or better percent of people over the age of 70 require some sort of vision correction. Glasses, contact lenses, LASIK surgery, cataract surgery, you name it. If you've reached 70 and you don't need some vision correction, you're in a very tiny minority. Wearable technology is all the rage today. How many people have a, I know Mary's got one, you got a Fitbit on or a, a, a step counter? How many people have watches that actually have hands on them? Oh look, wow. Smart watches, track your workouts, monitor your health, they answer the phone. Smart watches even tell time. Virtual reality goggles make you feel like you're inside the video game you're playing. You see, you've seen these ads of people wearing these glasses. Chances are just about everyone you're talking to is wearing some kind of device that makes life a little more interesting, informative, or convenient. However, most of the tech we wear isn't really essential to life. Somehow, many of us made it to adulthood with watches that only have hands. And for some folks, that piece of technology can mean the difference between life and death. Pacemakers, anybody have one? Yeah? Internal defibrillators, things that monitor and regulate your heartbeat. Now those, that's wearable technology. And while those technical advances certainly enable longevity of life, others are improving the quality of life for people with other kinds of disabilities. New wearable technology for the blind and visually impaired has the potential to make a huge difference in the quality of life of those who must navigate the world differently each day. I know this because the woman to whom I have pledged my love is beginning to show signs of macular degeneration at age 52. Oh. I studied up on the things that are available for her in the future, and one of them is called assistive technology or smart glasses. Devices that act as a visual or audio assistant for those with low or impaired vision. The two most popular ones now are called New Eyes Pro. There's, that's what they look like. They're lightweight glasses that use cameras to magnify the image that they're seeing up to 12 times, as well as provide the ability to change the colors if you're colorblind and contrast the image that the person is trying to observe. They permit those with lower vision in the center to see things more clearly on the outside. And they even come with an optical character recognition to recognize and read printed documents allowed to you. The Ara smart glasses use a different uh, approach for those who are completely blind or who are losing their vision. They use a built-in camera that is wirelessly connected to a trained assistant that can provide wireless, that can, that can provide spoken feedback to the person wearing them. So what you are seeing, your phone can tell you what it is you're seeing. These smart glasses are like having a constant pair of eyes guiding a blind person through the world like a seeing eye dog. Don't let the dog bark though. 
inside joke. Both of these pieces of technology are currently new, and yes, they are very expensive. But like most technology, they will become less expensive over time. And smart glasses can help a person with sight. And, and while they can help a person with sight, they can't help much with insight. The blind beggar Bartimaeus could have used these glasses before his encounter with Jesus, but Mark reveals that this blind man could actually see more clearly than his own disciples. Jesus and his disciples were passing through Jericho, we are told, where the cross awaited in Jerusalem. Jesus had warned his disciples three times that he was going this way to Jerusalem to die. But each time they failed to understand what he was talking about. Earlier on that road to Jerusalem, we had this last week, James and John come to Jesus with a request to sit at his right and his left when he came in glory. And Jesus had warned them again and again that his throne would not be the kind that they were hoping for because he came to give his life as a ransom for many. Even though these disciples had been with Jesus a long time, they still didn't see the truth about who he was and where he was leading them. But oddly enough, the blind man could see the truth even without 21st century technology. When Jesus passed by, Bartimaeus began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Only here in Mark is Jesus identified as the son of David. And by a blind man, no less. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus continually tries to keep the messianic secret, keep it quiet. Don't tell other people until you fully understand it. But clearly, it won't remain a secret much longer with this loud mouth. Bartimaeus is the one, however, who sees the truth. Son of David does call to mind the kind of Messiah that will be a military ruler like King David. But Bartimaeus sees this son of man differently as one who comes in mercy. Jesus, son of David... Have mercy on me is the cry of one who sees more of who Jesus really is than those whose eyes are supposedly functioning properly. In declaring Jesus as the merciful Messiah, however, Bartimaeus also seems to reveal that he sees more clearly the truth about himself. In contrast to James and John who, sit, who seek to sit beside Jesus in his glory on a way of, you know, in the way of enhancing themselves, Bartimaeus sees his own situation rather clearly. He's not using Jesus to gain glory for himself. Rather, he is himself, he sees himself as a beggar in need of the grace and mercy that is brought by the son of David who is also the Son of God. In a world where people believed that physical infirmity was a sign of spiritual brokenness or a punishment for sins done by a previous generation, Bartimaeus doesn't argue about the unfairness of being blind. He simply wants mercy. His persistent cry annoyed the crowd like a barking dog, but it caught Jesus' attention. Mark says, Jesus stood still before telling the crowd to call Bartimaeus to him. Standing still would enable Bartimaeus to find him and come to him. And Bartimaeus does. He threw off his cloak and he sprang up to come to Jesus. His question to the blind man is the same question, oddly enough, that he asked of James and John. What do you want for me to do to you? Do for you? 
The disciples wanted Jesus to make them great. Bartimaeus only wanted to see. He uses the same word, teacher, to address Jesus that the two ambitious disciples had used, but in this case, the plea comes from the one who actually understood the lesson, even though he had probably never read a scroll of scripture in his life. Bartimaeus may not have been able to see, but he has an expansive vision of a merciful Messiah who could open a new world for him. His spiritual smart glasses were working dead on. Jesus' response to the blind man is an invitation. Go, your faith has made you well. Bartimaeus responds to the command of Jesus not by going, but by coming along and following Jesus on the way. The implication is that he became a disciple. And if so, he now saw the way clearly. He was given sight because of his faithful insight. And now he could see the glory of God in the face of the son of David. In the Old Testament, when King David entered Jerusalem, he came as a conquering hero. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem taunted him by saying, the blind and the lame will turn you back. You will never enter the city. The son of David, in contrast to his ancestor, comes to remove blindness instead of the blind as he goes into the city. The story of Bartimaeus is a reminder that this Messiah has come to restore the sight of those who have been blinded by power, expectation, despair, or sin. Only those who are willing to put on the spiritual smart glasses of a humble and repentant disciple will see and understand how he conquers the city, how he conquers the world. Not through the power of might, but through the glory of the cross. Friends, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is for us all. Wearable smart glasses will be a great help for those who need them. But spiritual blindness requires a different sort of correction. Do you see Jesus as a means to an end, to enhance your reputation, your status, or your own glory? Do you see him merely as a means to get to heaven? If so, you need glasses. You need the kind of vision that even a blind man can have, the vision of humility, of faith, and desire to follow the one whose throne is not a seat, but a cross. It's not the latest gadget that will save you from spiritual blindness. Only faith will make you well. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Great and loving God, we thank you for the teachings and life of the one called Jesus, through whom we come to know you personally. We acknowledge that sometimes what we learn from him is difficult. We are not readily given to self-denial and cross-bearing, so we ask for faith and courage to follow in the ways of Jesus. Give us a bolder vision of who we can be. Grant us deeper compassion for others that our selfishness might not overwhelm us. Inspire us to love and give to others as a thankful response to your love and your gifts for us. For the sake of Christ, we pray. Amen. Saved a wretch like me.
I owe Jane an apology. Time could be a transitive verb, and so his savings would be correct. She's still batting a thousand then. Well, the World Series partners have been matched up. It's going to be Atlanta versus Houston. How many people are excited? Huh? It's football season. Hockey started this week, you know? Baseball has been through a couple of major changes in the last couple of years, but the big one is next year. Last couple of years, we've had things like um, if you're a relief pitcher, you come in, you, you have to pitch to three consecutive batters. You can't just come in to pitch to one batter. They're trying to speed things up, get them going a little faster. Because sometimes you have three different pitchers for three different batters, and it takes time. Um, in a doubleheader, you only play seven innings in both games. Makes it quicker, faster. You know, that's what we got to do, make things faster. Well, next year's big change, no more strategy. Pitchers will not have to bat in the National League. They can, but they won't. So now there will be pinch hitters in both leagues. And that's strategy for a lot longer reason than I've got time to explain to you. But that's going to be the big change next year. What's the next big change that's coming? Electronic umpires. Now, they haven't officially voted on this yet. But if you watch baseball on television, they put that box on the screen, you know, and they show you where the ball was and where it went, and they try and outguess the umpire. You know, when they do put that on the screen, how many times are the umpires wrong? Very, very few. So they must be doing something right. But I can't wait. This is going to be fun. There won't be an umpire. So who are we going to yell at? Isn't that part of baseball? You paid your ticket. That gives you the right to yell at the umpire. That used to be an old thing, you know. The umpire, you need glasses, buddy. Coke bottle bottoms, you know, and all of that stuff. Well, I don't know if that'll change the baseball as much as I think that the uh, getting rid of the or get, gaining the pinch hitter in both leagues, but uh, what, what, uh, what's the major change in your life when you were able to see Jesus? I'm not sure we, any of us have had that perfect vision yet. As Paul says, we see in a mirror now dimly, but then we will see clearly face to face. Let's keep working, let's keep working, let's keep going, let's keep improving our vision. The physical vision is done with glasses or contact lenses. The spiritual vision is done by Jesus. Let's keep working. Let's keep working. Let's keep working. Go out this week in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, giving thanks and praise always. Amen.